William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Anti-noise ordinances are fine and dandy. Makes living a lot more serene. But how can you legislate against the really disturbing noises, folks? The uh, noises in your head, that would be. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. The footwork a confidential cop puts in isn't always paid mileage. Some of it's for free in the public wheel and welfare. Like a trip I took to the tombs one day to see an inmate named Maxie Potter. I'd gotten a begging letter from Maxie. Could sweet charity move me to hurry to his side, end quote. Having a pint or so of the milk of human kindness in me, I complied. I found Maxie sitting on the edge of his cot. His eyes lit up like a hundred watt bulbs when he saw me. Barry Craig? That's me. Oh, you got a heart. And you got a nerve. Just for asking you to come? For confusing me with the Legal Aid Society. What's wrong with helping people? Starvation. I don't get paid. No cream in my farina. I'll tell you what. I'll owe you your expenses. The road to hunger is paved with bad debts. Oh, shades of Mrs. O'Houlihan. Mrs. O'Houlihan? My teacher in continuation school. That saying you said, she used to say it. But it made no impression on you. No. What I went for was, it's blessed to receive. And so you wrote to me. And so you're here. Now, what do you want? For you to get me out. I never engineer prison breaks. Bail. Put up the bail. How much? Five hundred. Dollar? Sure, dollars. Well, I haven't got it. Well, uh, Uncle Real Estate, then. They'll take that for bail. I've only got a cemetery plot. Uh, see, now wait. You're a citizen in good standing? Uh, opinions divided on that. Well, Judge Forganza, he'll let me out on your, uh, your, uh, 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 what's the word I'm trying for? Recognizance. Yeah, on your, well, will you? You sure got a cheek. I got troubles. I share them. I'm not proud. <laughs> What's the charge against you? Assault. Third degree. Hardly nothing. Who'd you hit? Randy Lomax, the talent agent. You might have heard of him? Everybody has. He's been promoting my girl. Feeding her baloney about how he's going to make her a big star. I lost my head. I hit him. What with? A brick. But that's between us. In court, I'm denying it. <laughs> Maxie had an appeal for me. He was pure Damon Runyon. I arranged his freedom on my recognizance. When that was done, I bought him a hamburger and coffee. Hey, reach me to relish once more, huh? You've just about demolished the jar. There's vitamins in relish. Besides, it's on the house. Relish? Ah, uh, man, you're sure a friend. And you're such a leech. Sadie, my girl, Sadie Sachs, we've been keeping company for six years. It's a long engagement, but Sadie likes long engagements. We had plans, the two of us. Raise rabbits and grapes as soon as we got two grand saved. Two grand saved? To buy a certain going business over in Jersey. Sadie and me, the two of us, we worked in the Blue City Distillery. In a distillery? Bottle washers, both of us. Oh. I made 60, Sadie made 40. Anyhow, everything was hunky-dory. Until Randy Lomax came along. Yeah, one fine day, the rat. He saw Sadie in the fun house at Atlantic City. He followed her around to the Ferris wheel and the wax museum. Couldn't let Sadie out of his sight. She had million-dollar legs. He kept writing that down, passing notes to her. All this behind my back. Please continue. Well, you try and stop me. Then Sadie wrote out a telephone number and passed it to him. Still behind your back. Oh, I had a couple of beers. I was blind. Anyhow, they met next day, and Lomax sold Sadie a bill of goods. Would she be a model? And did she have theatrical ambition? To which Sadie said, yay, brother. Well, what girl ain't conceited? That's the story, anyhow. Sadie signed up with Lomax. He gave her a new name, Paula Paloma. From a dirty blonde, he made her jet black so he could pass her off as Spanish. 
What a name. Ah! Paula Paloma. Which brings us to your fight with Lomax. He told Sadie to give me the brush. I was wrong for her future. I was a slob, and she was now imported stuff. The rest I told you. I met Lomax, I beamed him, I got locked up. I bailed you out. Now you go see Lomax and get him to drop the charges. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait till I write something out. Okay. It's written. Here. A note? Read it. It's an IOU. I don't want you doing too much for nothing. Talent agent Randy Lomax looked like his black Homburg had grown out of his skull. He was wearing it when I called on him. And what made that so remarkable? The guy was in his pajamas. All right. I withdraw the assault charge against Maxie Potter on one condition. Name it. Maxie jumps off a high building. You want him dead? Dead. Or far, far away. Craig, tell you what. What? Maxie settles down in the Congo. Permanently. He signs a stipulation to the fact that it is permanent. Otherwise? I'll prosecute him to the limit. Such seething hatred for Maxie. Why? He's a pest. A menace, a loudmouth, a jerk. And lunatic. You cost him a girl he was planning to marry. <laughs> That's Maxie's hallucination. You go ask Paula Paloma her point of view on Maxie. Alias Paula Paloma. She's Sadie Sachs. Look, forget the name Sadie Sachs. Oh, the public. We spent thousands advertising the name Paula Paloma. Paula Paloma from Madrid, Spain. That's her origin. Her mother was a royal countess. Her father was a fabulous industrialist. Her boyfriend was Maxie Potter of Jersey City. Shh. You deliberately trying to aggravate me. I came here representing Maxie. Maxie. Yeah. Let me show you the type of character you got for a client. I had a private detective draw me a diagram of Maxie. A report, Maxie's background, where he came from, why he gets in my hair. How come one man can be so crazy? Here. Cast an eye over this line on a two-page report. Hmm. 1949. The Inwood Home. Six months. Yeah, the Inwood Home is a sanitarium in Ohio. Maxie's punch drunk. Craig, on my advice, dump Maxie in the North River. Besides crowning you with a milk bottle in a, a, an impetuous moment, uh, what other specific grievance have you against Maxie? He insults me on the streets. Language that makes my spine crawl. He hires children to throw garbage at me when I pass. And look, in a public restaurant, in front of a hundred show people, show people, my bread and butter, mind you, Maxie pours a plate of soup on my head. What kind of soup? Noodle soup. Limp noodles hanging from my brow like excelsior on a Christmas tree. Have I got specific grievances? <laughs> Sounds like it. It's not all so comical. I'm made ridiculous. But I'm also in mortal danger. How's that? Threats to kill me. Threats in what form? The cowardly form only punchy Maxie could use. Here, these. Cartridges. Low caliber. Low, high, medium. They mean murder. I find them everywhere. On my office desk, on the dining table, they come in the mail. A bullet to a letter. Craig, I'm being hounded into fear and insanity. Why do you only suspect Maxie? I got reasons. Well, let me hear. All right. These cartridges. They've been identified for me as belonging to Maxie. Identified by whom? Paula Paloma. Sadie Sachs. Craig. Again, I beg you, please forget her other name. I checked Maxie's mental condition with Paula Paloma. Was he ever actually confined to a sanitarium? In the time we were going together, twice. I see. You identified certain cartridges. Lomax told you, huh? Lomax did. Why do you say they were Maxie's? Because I saw the identical ones in Maxie's room at least 50 times. He kept them in a candy jar on his mantelpiece. Why would Maxie keep cartridges in a candy jar? Ask Maxie why. Could Maxie kill Lomax? Anybody could kill anybody. It's a free country, haven't you heard? Name somebody besides Maxie who has it in for Lomax. Daisy. Who is Daisy? Lomax's wife. Used to be, I mean... There's a saying, there's no fury, uh, 
No fury. Like a woman scorned. That's Daisy. A woman scorned. She'd kill Lomax in a flash. Other enemies of the great man? People. A man with Lomax's lust for power must make enemies of the little people. How do you feel about Lomax? I worship the ground. He's my good angel, my hero. He took me out of a $40 job as bottle washer. And made you the toast of New York. In one short year. I've got furs, a French maid, a Belgian wolfhound, and a bank account. Mm -hmm. Love that Lomax. Why don't you tell Maxie you were never serious with him? So he'll stop having delusions and stop bothering Lomax. Stop bothering Lomax and start bothering me. Mm -mm. Better he should bother Lomax. Lomax can take it, I can't. Positively not. That evening, my client, Maxie, made no bones about being a little on the weird side. Sure, I'm spooky. I ever say I wasn't? No, not in so many words. Why are you looking shocked, Craig? Well, the fact is, I had you characterized as whimsical, a sort of a colorful screwball. So now you're no different. So you uh, ever get really violent, Maxie? Every so often. The other day, I bit the ear off in the dog. Why? The mutt was annoying me, jumping on and off my lap so I couldn't read the racing form. Was I justified? Uh, Maxie. What? I don't want to be a fair-weather friend, but... Uh... Hey, you're not edging up to ask me to go back to the tombs. Well, on the loose like this, I'm responsible for you. So I ain't behaving? Are you? Yeah, I am. How about the cartridges you keep bombarding Lomax with? Oh, you uh, know about them, huh? I know about them. Well, I'll quit doing it, okay? I don't need to be doing it anymore anyhow. What does that mean? Well, I did it to scare Lomax, but Lomax won't scare anymore. Not the way he is. The way he is? Well, what does that mean? It means I had a dream. Just before, right after lunch. I dropped off for a snooze, you know, a few fast winks. Anyhow, I, I had a dream about Lomax. I always dream after pastrami and gherkins. Gherkins is what they call pickles. Yeah. Well, what did you dream about Lomax? That he was sleeping like me. Only he wasn't dreaming. Couldn't dream even if he wanted to. Not with all that lead in him. You dream Lomax was dead? Yeah, in his parlor. His head on the floor and his feet up on the sofa. An upside-down position. <laughs> A comical look to him. Hey, hey, where you going? Telephone, Lomax. I want to know if you were only dreaming, client. You're wasting time, Craig. How can a stiff get up to answer the telephone? Maxie, get your hat. We're both paying Lomax to call. Sure. Oh, but hey, on the way, let's stop off at a florist. Huh? I want to blow ten bucks on a wreath for Lomax. I soon discovered that Maxie had uncanny powers of prophecy and divination. Get off the buzzer. Lomax can't hear it. Door's locked. Give it your shoulder. I'll have to, I guess. Some light on the subject, huh? Well, is it like I dreamed? Yeah. Only there's a discrepancy. What? You said feet on the sofa and head off. Yeah, I said. All of Lomax is on the floor. Hey, what do you expect from a dream? 100% accuracy? Oh, shot through the neck. And down there, in the ribs. Maxie, did you do it? I wished I had. You may wish you hadn't. I was asleep in the room, I told you, dreaming. Hey, you gonna cause trouble for me? I should have my head examined for bailing you out of the tombs. Do that, why don't you? I'm for examining heads, like teeth. Why is a head any different than a tooth, huh? Maxie, right off, I'm handing you back to whence I got you. Right off? Take care of Lomax first, huh? He's dead. Show some respect. With my number one suspect back where I found him, the tombs, I held a crying towel for Sadie Sachs, uh... That is, Paula Paloma. I'm finished. Through. Everything was going good, and now I'm finished. 
So is Lomax finished through. I'll be back washing bottles. Oh, I knew in my heart my good luck was too good to last. Lomax's death doesn't necessarily put the kibosh on your career. Lomax was my career. I'm his invention, his creation. Without him, I'm nobody. Boy, consider what the man did for me. I've seen the billboards. He got me elected Miss Gooseberry Pie of 1954, Miss Bottle Drink, and the girl most likely to... Most likely what? Oh, I forgot. I'm destroyed. Utterly destroyed. I'm a battleship at sea without an engine. Oh, that Maxie. Nothing points conclusively to Maxie. That ex-wife of Lomax's. Daisy. Do I remember your saying she had it in for him? She hated him. Everybody on Broadway knows that. Well, we're off Broadway. Where can I find Daisy? Stand on any corner and holler. She'll come running. Look, I want to cry myself to death, so stop asking me questions and go away, huh? I found Daisy behind a beaded curtain. The Chop Suey Parlor in Bath Beach, Brooklyn. She was running the joint. A middle-aged lady middleweight with a peroxide bleach and a washed-up look. So Lomax is dead. So I'm heartbroken. I tell you what, mister. Out of sentiment to my ex, I'll hang a dish rag at half-mast. What's your burning gripe against your late ex-husband? <laughs> I could fill an encyclopedia. Fill one page. Girls. Girls and girls. I was a wife always competing with protégés. But that was Lomax's business, finding talent and building them up to fat contract status. Why, Lomax was building up his discoveries. He was building me down, burying me. You were neglected. I had to hand Lomax my card so he'd remember who I was. Nights when he'd come home, he'd hand me his. And a tip. He had me confused with a hat check girl. Who divorced who? He, me. He sneaked it in through Mexico. I was too demoralized to fight him. He bought me this chop suey parlor so I wouldn't be an alimony load. Looks like a nice little business. You don't have to be polite. I net $50 a week, clear. I'm lucky. When I was Mrs. Lomax, I spent $50 a day on cologne. Life makes changes. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha, and it just did for Lomax. <laughs> He'll turn over in his grave. What does that mean? That phony baloney Mexican divorce. I was never notified. I never agreed to it. I never signed nothing. Tomorrow, I'm calling up Greenspan and Kilroy. They're my lawyers. I'm ordering them to move to have the divorce canceled. Junked. Why would you want to resume being Mrs. Lomax? Guess. To be his legal widow, huh? To get my dowry rights in his estate. Smart. It all kind of brings you under suspicion. How so? If you can turn death to profit, that underlines a motive for murder. <laughs> so it underlines, so I'm laughing. Huh. Do you want a real suspect? I do. Shipley. Harry Shipley. Who's he? Confidential secretary in the Marathon Wonder Enterprises Incorporated. That's Lomax's company. There was bad blood between Shipley and Lomax. Then why would Lomax keep Shipley on? I was never sure. Something Shipley had on Lomax and vice versa, something Lomax had on Shipley. <laughs> you never knew Lomax. Nobody did. He was always underhanded. Nothing with Lomax was ever clean cut out in the open. When's Lomax's funeral? The police will release the body for burial tonight. The funeral's tomorrow at 10 a.m. I'll be there. As his legal widow. You be there, too, and watch Shipley. Never mind Lomax in his coffin, just watch Shipley. Watch him and you'll see a happy man. Happy because Lomax is dead. I hadn't exactly planned on attending the funeral. Attend! This funeral will be good for you. How so? Perk you up, forget your troubles, make you glad to be alive. Simply delighted. At funerals sometimes, the skies smile. Other times, they don't. Thunderbolts, rain and buckets. The skies weren't smiling a bit. But Shipley was. Grins as wide as a poster advertising a Coney Island funhouse. I'd seen guys smile before. Sweepstakes winners, fathers of quintuplets. DiMaggio when he married La Monroe. Never in my life before had I seen a smile as big as the one on Shipley's kisser. 
There was no eulogy at Lomax's grave, like nobody had a good word to say about him. Later, in a tavern a stone's throw from the cemetery gates, Shipley let on he didn't need to have a good word to say about his late boss, Lomax. As long as you're buying drinks, Mr. Craig. Hey, bartender, another uh, orange aid for my friend. You were saying, Shipley? Rotten egg, that Lomax. Money was his god. What did he have on you? Come on, Daisy told me a few things. I owed him money. You owed the till, you mean, huh? You did a little embezzling? How much did you borrow from Lomax and all? $22,000. Why didn't he can you, or jail you, or both? Well, I, I had knowledge that was disadvantageous to Lomax. What? Come on, talk up, Shipley. I'm trying to satisfy myself that you didn't murder Lomax. Income tax evasion as confidential secretary. I knew the truth about Lomax's books. Yes, you would. Uh, Shipley. Yeah? Take me to the offices of Marathon Wonder Enterprises. Show me Lomax's books and stuff, huh? Well... It's all on my responsibility, Shipley. You're doing it involuntarily. I'm making you do it. Anybody asks you, that's your excuse. I'm the beast, forcing you to be unethical toward a dead boss. Let's go. After four hours of snooping at the Marathon Wonder Enterprises, I got to know Lomax's business so intimately it would send a chill through Lomax. If he were alive, that is. I've done my very best to acquaint you. You've been a real help. Lucrative racket, Lomax's. His estate, when audited, will easily total a million dollars. Well, all for talent scouting. Uh-uh, ownership of talent. Lomax wasn't only a ten percenter. No, he wasn't. That much became clear tonight. He signed talent to ten-year contracts with renewal options on lopsided terms. Lopsided in favor of Lomax. Mm -hmm. One Lomax property, the actor Baxter Burroughs, now with Clinton Pictures, made more than a quarter million dollars in the last two years. Yeah, I read those figures. Had Lomax lived, he was certain to make an equivalent or greater sum through Paula Paloma. Sadie Sachs. Oh, let's see that letter again, huh? Yeah, here you are. From the Mecca Elwin Bayer Motion Picture Company. A firm offer of a seven-year contract to Paula Paloma. At $4,000 a week, scaling upwards every year. I'd say that's the best contract offer Lomax ever received for any talent he represented. Four grand a week with Lomax in for half. Half, plus certain expenses. Lomax was a genius at adding expenses. The 50% generally came closer to 70. Bad time to die. With money coming at him from all sides. Uh, thanks, Shipley. It's been enlightening. Wait, Mr. Craig. What? The money I borrowed from Lomax, uh, I've been repaying it so much a week for years now. How much still outstanding? Oh, a relatively small sum, really negligible. Then I guess you've got nothing to worry about, Shipley. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Daisy, Maxie, Shipley, Paula. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, who done it? Maxie tried to simplify the guesswork for me. He tossed a bombshell at me through Paula. Read this. Love letter from an admirer? From Maxie in the tombs, a human document. Mr. Craig, it's the cry of a tortured soul. Dear Sadie. Well, very interesting stuff. So what do you think? Maxie himself write this? It's Maxie's handwriting. Well, say something. It's a little incredible. In the letter, Maxie apologizes to you for murdering Lomax. He cost me a dear friend and advisor. Now Maxie's sorry. If true, this amounts to a confession. If true? Why shouldn't it be true? It's Maxie's own statement, his own words. Nobody forced him. Maxie being Maxie, uh, you can't blame me for taking him with a box of salt, huh? Wrap the body beautiful in the mink doll. We're paying a formal visit to Maxie. We found Maxie dining on caviar and chopped onion. Mmm, all the eating's good in here. Caviar on the prison menu? A ladies' benevolent society come through. They give me this caviar and a cigar. Oh, hey, I forgot how you said it. 
The name's Paula. Uh, this letter you sent Paula. Still stand by what it says, Maxie? Yeah, sure. So I murdered Lomax. What can they do to me? Fry you. Like fish. Am I responsible for what I do? Aren't you? I got a record that says I ain't. So you figure to beat the rap by pleading insanity? Insanity for the time being. <laughs> Only while I shot Lomax. <laughs> All of a sudden, I blanked out. When I come to, it was Lomax, dead on the floor and a smoking gun in my hand. Where's the gun? Oh, forget I threw it away someplace. Nice try, Maxie. It proves something. Proves what? That knighthood is still in flower for a price. For Bryce? Whatever Paula here promised you for taking the heat off her. Paula promised? Hey, what kind of booby talk? Mr. Craig, I must say I resent the insinuation. Not insinuation, Dow. Accusation. You, you're accusing me? Of getting Maxie to take the chance of a temporary insanity plea for a murder you did. Craig, you're more gone than me. Why would Sadie here... Excuse me, Paula. Why would Paula here want to knock off Lomax, the best friend she had? For money. To recover 100% of herself. Paula. What? Your million-dollar future with the movies. How much of a piece did Lomax have? I mean, while he was alive. Well, went to the usual 10%. Lomax wasn't a 10%er. I mean, half. Half plus. Expenses off the top. For the build-up he gave you. Quite a bill there. Lomax knew how to run up astronomical figures. The way I calculated it in Lomax's office a few hours ago, you'd be working years for Lomax. All for Lomax, very little for you. You'd have a showcase, Lomax would keep all the marbles. How did a sensitive young lady of your refinement bring herself to shoot a man down in cold blood? All of a sudden, Sadie blanked out. When she come to, there was Lomax, dead. It was a pleasure shooting Lomax, a regular picnic. Lomax had it all fixed for me to be his slave. Well, I'm nobody's slave. You'll tell your story, Sadie. How you killed a rat and a conniver who came between us. The judge will ball like a kid. The jury won't even go out. Not guilty, Sadie. That's a verdict for sure. Suppose you two stay here and make plans. I've got to see a man about a murder. Mr. Craig, you're not leaving me here. Oh, an affectionate couple like you and Maxie made for each other. A housekeeping cell for two. Kids, I don't know a cheaper way for a loving couple to get started in life. So long now. Hey, God, open up. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, For Love of Murder, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of Death's Bargain Basement, about which Barry Craig has this to say. We call next week's story Death's Bargain Basement. It takes place in a department store because, as you all know, bargain basements are always found in department stores. But so, on occasion, is death. Good night, folks. See you next week. A national broadcasting company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Barney Phillips, Tom McKee, Barbara Fuller, Gloria Ann Simpson, and Herb Ellis. Eddie King speaking. There's another exciting dragnet adventure tonight on the NBC Radio Network. <laughs>